Okay, well, you're at the Swine Biosecurity uh, conversation. I'm Dr. Steve Dudley. I'm a veterinarian from uh, Worthington, Minnesota. I've been a uh, swine, swine veterinarian there, uh, graduated in 1987 from Kansas State University. Uh, originally a Nebraska boy, grew up out in west central Nebraska in Gothenburg and uh, moved to Worthington and been there ever since. So I work with uh, Southwest Veterinary Services, which is our veterinary group in Worthington, and we're the uh, primarily partners with Farmers Business Network for their livestock division. The di disclosure that what I say is mine, we'll, we'll own it for that. But what we want to talk about today is uh, biosecurity in the swine industry. And there's uh, kind of the agenda will cover uh, biosecurity for sow units. Our, our sow units have historically done a really good job of biosecurity. And uh, we've taken some of those biosecurity principles and applied them to our, our cattle producers, our dairy producers. And, uh, but, but the swine operations clearly have led the, the way along with the poultry uh, units. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the grow finish portion of swine biosecurity and things that we can do better there. Um, our, swine, our, our grow finish producers historically have not uh, invested or done the same levels of uh, expectation. We're gonna talk about an Iowa State study called staged loading, which uh, I think really helps to highlight some of the importance of grow finish biosecurity. And then we're gonna blow through the PQA, TQA highlights and talk, everybody knows about that that's in the swine industry. And then we'll talk a little bit about the secure pork supply and contrast that to the new program called the Swine Health Improvement Plan. And the analogy that I'll be using as we get to those programs is that the PQA and TQA are kind of the branches of the tree. You could think of each one of your uh, producers or each one of your employees as kind of a branch of the individual tree. And the secure pork supply is gonna be the tree um, where you're talking about trying to prevent problems in your individual tree. And the swine health improvement program is the whole forest and what we will do. So uh, we'll kind of come back and, and talk about some of those analogies as we go on. So the best practices for sow operations, uh, again, as I mentioned, the sows have historically done a, a great job of trying to prevent disease. Even in spite of that, we've continued to have tremendous uh, disease challenges. Uh, PERS continues to be a major problem for the industry. Um, PED, a, a few years ago, really highlighted some of the poor biosecurity that uh, our sow operations did, and it, I think that did help to help it become a higher priority for, for the industry. But the considerations that we're always thinking about with any biosecurity program is people. Um, so what are the people entry points that are coming onto a sow unit? What are the pig entry points? So pigs and pig, uh, or people and pigs. Uh, there are feed considerations. So there's lots of data. Uh, Dr. Scott D has been, uh, at, who was at the University of Minnesota where he did a lot of the work and now currently at the Pipestone Systems. Um, and he's done, been a leader in helping to identify some of the viruses that can be transmitted through feed. And so that's a, that's a concern with PED, a number of the uh, coronavirus pathogens. Um, there's, and then area spread would be the other thing that we're always thinking about. And, you know, area spread, we're, we're always struggling with how much, as we think of the percentage of breaks, how much is area spread versus people versus pigs versus feed. And I've never seen any data or information on that my personal preference or my personal opinion is that area spread is by far the least. I think it's less than, uh, you know, in my opinion, probably less than 5%. I think it's the other areas that are, are more important. So as we think of biosecurity, uh, shower in, shower out is a very common uh, 
you know, decision that many swine operations, and I would say the majority, are utilizing anymore. Um, the Danish entry system is where you're going to walk into a facility, sit down, there's a, a, a defined clean, dirty line, uh, sit down, change clothes, leave your boots. This is a particular sow unit where they use the Danish entry to get into the shower. And so they're going to sit down, leave their shoes out here on the bench, uh, sit on the bench, spin around, go into the shower, shower through the facility. Um, but I think really with all of the programs that I'm going to be talking about and all of you as you go home is to process what uh, can we do on a consistent basis? Because it doesn't make sh it makes sense. It doesn't make any sense to have a great program and then everybody just sort of walks by, walks by the shower, walks by, uh, and so consistency and really a an, an agreement within either the the owners, the the workers, and the entire organization that this is what we're going to do and here's what we're going to follow. Um, so consistency is the key, and then. You know, uh, air filtration was a huge um, inflection point for the swine industry to be able to identify and really increase and notch up our bio swine biosecurity. And I think what, what the filtration did is it made everybody sit down and say, okay, we're spending A, we're investing a significant amount of money to filter this sow unit. And with that comes a new level of emphasis that we're going to place on people movement, on pig movement, and really uh, finding, uh, defining those roles and rules. And so I think that fil air filtration really was, did serve the swine industry well to, to kind of tap in. And that, you know, it hasn't 100% eliminated all the breaks, but it, it's still a challenge. So here's some of the biosecurity practices that sow units have put in place to eliminate disease and, and spread. So air filtration, as I mentioned, uh, disinfectant of supplies. So many operations today have a disinfectant room. Supplies are brought in, put into the disinfectant room. They're fumigated. Um, they're brought in from the outside, placed in there the fumigation and then the sow unit from the inside can go ahead and retrieve those supplies, bring them on in. Showers, as we mentioned, the bench entry system, uh, cleaning and disinfectant areas on the facility as well as thermal drying of trailers and facilities that are gonna, or uh, equipment that's gonna be coming on to the farm. And then identifying uh, people movement of downtime. How long do we require people to be down away from pigs before they can come in? And then dedicated personnel that are going to come into the facility and or dedicated transport. So those are all things that are, are common biosecurity practices within, I would say, the majority of sow units that are, that are still around. So I want to contrast our biosecurity practices for grow finish. And the grow finish operations uh, are not as robust with our, with our program. And so why is it as important for our, our grow finish operations? Well, the cost of disease is significant. And as uh, Dr. Darrell Holdcamp in 2013 and 2012, he said it was two bucks. Uh, in 2013, he said the cost of uh, per pig for PERS outbreaks was $4.67 per pig. So a significant cost. And 62% of the cost of a PERS outbreak is tied to the finishing pigs. So it's not just the impact to the sow unit. 62% of that cost is driven to the, to the grow finish operation. The other significant reason that we want to improve our grow finish biosecurity is that grow finish is uh, grow finish outbreaks of PERS is a very good predictor of sow units in that same area breaking with PERS. And so Iowa State has a, uh, I guess that's my next slide, but Iowa State has a very good uh, 
graphic which shows that as the PERS incidence increases with our grow finish operations, three to five weeks later we see sow operations break with PERS. So whatever's going on in the grow finish then eventually does make its way uh, into some of the sow units. So that's certainly a, a reason that we want to make sure we're dealing with grow finish biosecurity. And then the last consideration that I wanted to mention is that 92% of the pig industry uh, population is grow finish pigs. So, you know, as we think of, you know, I put national security, it's maybe not uh, U United States national security, but from a pig biosecurity standpoint, uh, the majority of our, of our livestock swine is in the grow finish portion of the business. Again, as I mentioned, consistency is the key to setting up any of our biosecurity programs. And we've got to be, doing, be able to do something that uh, we're disciplined about that's going to happen 24-7. Um, whether that's changing boots and coveralls, whether it's a Danish entry that you put in, uh, whatever you're going to implement in your grow finish facilities, we want to make sure that you're doing that consistently. Uh, my wife says I'm not a very consistent person, and I'm not, so I would really, this would be hard for me. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm usually late, running behind, got, you know, a fault is that I say I can get a lot more done in a day than, than I should, and so those are not good personality traits for a consistent 24-7 biosecurity program. And so those are things I think you got to be honest with yourself and with your organization and put in things that will work. Uh, if you change coveralls, change boots, wash hands, use a Danish entry, to me, that you can get done. Um, grow Finish typically has not invested the capital to uh, take grow, uh, biosecurity as, as serious as the sow units have. So those investments when you pay for something, you're more willing to adhere to it. So, you know, as we, uh, the return on investment for biosecurity is seen as a cost on the grow finish versus uh, an asset where you get a return. You know, I think the other challenge with grow finish uh, operations is our labor availability. And we know that uh, labor is short, it's tight, um, and Oftentimes, one worker is working in multiple grow finish barns. So as they're traveling from one area, one barn to the next, you've got to have a good biosecurity program that they'll adhere to. You know, do we have enough drivers? And um, all, those are all challenges you're all dealing with. You know, cr contract. Uh, facilities versus owned facilities, who owns the pigs, who owns the buildings, those are additional uh, challenges that we have as we think of grow finish biosecurity. One of the things to consider is when is disease breaking and that maybe sometimes will indicate to us where the problem is as we think of uh, breaks and biosecurity breaches. So if we've got an early infection, so if we bring the pigs in and they're breaking with, you know, PED or uh, some sort of E. coli problem, or if they're breaking with PERS within the first month post-arrival, we think of different potential biosecurity challenges. You know, was the wean truck movement the problem? Uh, if you have a vaccination crew come in, could have they been one of the challenges uh, that brought in the problem. People's always a, an issue. Um, and then was there poor site cleanup and disinfection? And so as we think of beta hemolytic E. coli outbreaks, which is a challenge in a lot of our nurseries, we always see that in the first month of age. You know, was that, did it come with the pigs? Did they pick it up in the, in the unit? And uh, early infections, that's what we're thinking about. As we go to halfway through, you know, the pigs came in, they started really well, uh, and then we had PERS challenges or respiratory challenges. You know, how are we removing the dead stock? Uh, 
as it's going, is, you know, is rendering coming? Are you doing compost? You're having a, a, a co combined place to go. Um, and that is a potential area of concern if you're halfway through. People's consistent. And then repairs, you know, if, if, if repair people are coming on, you can't do it yourself, um, that can be another point of secu biosecurity breach. And then the late infections, uh, things we're always worried about is loading procedures as we're taking the initial cuts out of a barn. So, you know, if those trailers are coming back, uh, how are they handled, uh, any slaughter, uh, trucks and rendering to me would still be a, a challenge up here in late infection. So then random infections kind of throughout the entire uh, grow finish period would be these aerosol and location changes. And so those are real. I don't mean to, to downplay them, but I sometimes think that we as people tend to blame others. And so instead of uh, uh, looking at ourselves and saying, well, yeah, I, you know, I was late for a meeting, I ran in, I just checked quick, I didn't adhere to bio biosecurity, and then we had a break, versus saying, yeah, it blew in, because then it's, it's no fault of our own. So trying to be honest with yourself and your organizations is, in my opinion, extremely critical. As I mentioned, uh, I'm a big advocate of the Danish entry. Most of the uh, data sh looks really good if people are consistent with Danish entry, meaning, you know, clothes, exterior clothes stay on the outside, or you put in boots, coveralls, uh, have a very defined, clean, dirty line. Uh, shower in, shower out, I see very few grow finish operations that do that. I just think it's probably unrealistic, and uh, I don't. I see a lot of showers in grow finish uh, buildings. I've, rarely have I seen anybody use them. You know, usually the vet will, will we always never want to be blamed, so we'll sometimes use them. But um, so I wouldn't invest in them if people really aren't going to use them. And uh, so there's still lots of opportunities for us to to improve grow finish uh, biosecurity in our operations. We know that uh, one of the challenges in the next slides and the, the, what we're going to talk about is Iowa State's stage loading, but we know that finishing pigs are marketed over several weeks you know, to a month. So as we do those initial cuts and going out, you know, some, some folks may be able to, to empty a barn at one time, but I think that's probably uh, the exception, not the rule. And so the goal is how do we keep those animals free of disease as we start to pull uh, the first pigs out of them. We also want to make sure, you know, the first goal is keep them free of disease so that we don't get impacted at the end. And then the second is we want to make sure that we don't have these area spreads uh, going. And we already talked about uh, the sow farms that uh, break due to wean finish activity. And here's where I mentioned this Iowa State disease reporting has a nice, uh, a nice graphic chart that lays that out. So uh, this next portion of my talk is, uh, was presented at the Al Lehman Swine Conference. And so Dr. Daryl Holtkamp, uh, who is a professor at Iowa State University, presented this information. So I want to give credit to him and his team of students that, uh, that did this work. But I really liked this talk because it highlighted some of the challenge that grow finish operators have. And uh, I know some of the folks in the room, and I think it's important uh, for you to consider some of these, these changes. So we've already talked a little bit about why does it matter. Um, finishing pigs are marketed over uh, multiple weeks. And so there's, there's an opportunity to infect those pigs as we bring uh, facilities, trucks, drivers, people, uh, loadout crews, uh, other workers to help us with that. And we talked about some of the economic losses. And again, a lot of these studies were done in 2012-13 when we didn't have uh, the six, seven dollar corn that we have today. So clearly 
there's a different economic uh, incentive today to minimize disease. But it's expensive. We know that uh, with PEDV, uh, Pavlicek showed in 2018 that average daily gain was knocked 21% uh, during the end of the time period. So PED just was really uh, devastated uh, your weight gains at that end. And then there's indirect economic losses from, from death loss as well as just people management, time, effort, and energy. So there's kind of three failures that we're going to talk about when we get disease introduced at the end of the growth finish period. So failure number one is uh, the pathogen or the virus agent contaminates the, the trailer. So do livestock trailers that are hauling market pigs get contaminated when they go to the packer to drop off? Obviously they do. And so Jim Lowe and his team in 2014 showed as we were breaking with PED that that clearly happened. You know, the, the clean truck would have pigs, they'd back up to the slaughter facility, they'd unload, they worked really hard to make sure no pigs were going back on and off, but inevitably some of uh, those pigs would and there would be contamination, they'd be able to find PED virus in those trailers. So failure number one is we know that those uh, semis and those trailers are going to become contaminated. So failure number two um, is that we didn't do anything about that infection. So the semi-trailer was infected, then what did we do to mitigate or stop that? So from cleaning to disinfecting to uh, thermal baking the trailer, what did we do to mitigate and stop that uh, from occurring? And so there's lots of variation in how livestock uh, trailers are handled. You know, there's challenges to infrastructure. You know, there's public uh, truck washes, there's private truck washes, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not consistent. But all three of these failures have to occur before the virus gets into the farm. So the last failure that has to occur is the truck was contaminated, it didn't get decontaminated, then that truck shows up onto your grow finish sites, and then that virus has to be tracked from, the farm, from that trailer into your facility. And that's the third failure. So we want to do, you know, can that contamination on the trailer be transferred to the pigs that are in the barn? And that's where this staged loading procedure comes into play. And so uh, the sta staged loading procedures did redu reduce the likelihood of this third failure. So here was the uh, study objective. Um, and it was utilized with glow germ. I don't know uh, if anybody, has anybody in the audience seen glow germ work? So a couple of you. So glow germ's really interesting and we, we really like this. I've, I've got a couple stories where we brought in uh, producers and did a post-mortem study and I put a clear, you know, I didn't tell them about it. So we put a clean, dirty line and then I said, that's dirty over there, this is clean. When you step over, put your booties on and then I'd put glow germ over there and, and it shows up with fluorescence. So you take a, uh, an ultraviolet light, flashlight, and you can see it, it shows up really uh, easily and it shows up on feet and hands and, and everywhere. So it's a great tool to uh, work with your organization to simulate a virus. So that's what they're doing here. They're saying that the uh, virus worked. So here's how this was set up. This would be a conventional loading procedure where the driver and the semi would uh, stay up here and this is considered zone A. And they took glow germ and they put it into this corner of the semi-trailer to simulate a virus. And then there's the clear line of separation that we're wanting to put in place so that 
you know, the, the driver doesn't cross that. And once the pigs cross that line of separation, we don't want them coming back. And then zone B is the, is the finisher and the loadout area along with the, with the barn. So that is a conventional uh, loadout procedure. The staged loadout procedure, um, we've got the driver with our line of separation, but the zone B is confine, confined to just the loadout area. And you had to have some sort of a buffer uh, area where the, you know, as they're bringing the, the hogs up here, putting them into the loadout, that guy had to get out of the way. Um, but this was zone B, and then the rest, the remaining part of the facility was zone C. Um, so this was the staged loading setup. So experimental unit was the load. So um, the barn uh, had, all the barns had similar layouts, they had similar fixed chutes, and the same production company uh, had all the barns. So this is identified at the end, it was Iowa Select, so this was uh, done in Iowa, Iowa Select was the production company. They had 10 uh, groups that were conventional and 10 groups that, where they did the staged loading procedure. Um, and they tried to, to put the different replicates as similar as they could. Uh, everything was done at the last load of the day. You know, they couldn't, they, what they didn't want to do, you can't do it one time and then come back and do it. So it was the last load of the day, whether it was conventional or the staged. And um, it was the same loadout crew. They had four people that were the loadout crew. They were the same for 18 of the 20 replicates. So uh, there was two of the conventional where a different crew came in, but otherwise they were, they were all the same. And they spent quite a bit of time doing training on the stage loading procedure. Um, with diagrams in English and Spanish so that it was clearly communicated uh, what they were trying to do, what the goals and objectives of the trial were. So here were the, uh, the results again. So again, they took 216 grams of the glow germ, put it with uh, a half a liter, 500 mils of OB gel, and that was to make it so that it didn't blow around. And then they took a half a pound or a quarter of a kilogram of wood shavings, mix that all together, and then that's what was placed in the semi-trailer. Uh, then they observed the loadout procedures, so the students that were doing the trial then stood back, the four folks that were doing the actual loadout did their work, and the students were uh, back there observing, and recording any deviations, variations, and then they counted the number of these five by five squares for any fluorescence. So the higher the number of fluorescence, the more potential virus was tracked in. And there was 264 grids in this uh, uh, wire thing that they spread around. So they did the loadout, then when they got done, they had eight different places where they counted all of the fluorescence. So number one was right behind this line of separation, two others in the loadout area, and then uh, four through eight was back inside the building. And here was their results. So uh, up here, conventional is the red. So all the red uh, lines are conventional. And then the blue was the staged uh, facility or stage procedure. So you can see with number one back over here, there was no difference. And number two, there was no difference. And number three, there was no difference. So number one, no difference. Number two, no significant difference. Number three, no significant difference with the amount of fluorescence or the amount of virus that was tracked back in. But 
as we look at where the actual pigs was, here's where there's a significant difference. And so all of these, uh, A versus B means there is a statistical difference here. And um, so clearly there was less virus in each of the last four uh, locations that they identified. Some obvious uh, or some other observations that we occurred, the shoot was always contaminated as we identified. There was no difference there. So that first line of separation, you know, it's just not always honored. Pigs, you know, if you've ever loaded pigs, you understand that they don't cooperate. Uh, they run on and off. It's, uh, there was no different there. And recognizing that not all your grow finished barns are gonna be set up for this staged uh, loading procedure but there may be some value in uh, investing or rethinking how uh, you wanna do that going forward. So clearly the staged loading procedure is effective at reducing the transfer of contamination for livestock trailers. So with that scenario, even if failure number one occurred, the semi was contaminated, failure number two occurred, we didn't do a good job of disinfecting the trailer when it came back, if we were using a staged loading procedure, we would not have failure uh, with transferring it into the barn. So there's opportunities to, to improve. And uh, you know I think effective use of gates and barriers, but this you gotta really think about because I know one of the things Dr. Holdcamp talked about with this is that historically, the, the culture is to help everybody. So, you know, the, wherever you're at in the barn, hogs getting loose, you're running up helping them. Uh, nope, not in, in the stage loading procedure, you had to do your job and stay in that area. You didn't cross lines of separation. So you just gotta be clearly uh, identifying what the goals are and training uh, is, a, is an important issue. So uh, again, want to acknowledge Iowa State, the work they've done there, uh, Dr. Holcamp, Iowa Select, and uh, the folks that allowed us to, to talk about that. Is there any questions on any of that before we uh, move on? Again, I think it, it, in my opinion, it did a nice job of uh, highlighting uh, an area of our grow finish that we can, can do a better job of. So the last portion of my talk uh, I wanted to highlight kind of the difference PQA and, and the different voluntary programs that are out there that we're trying to do as an industry to um, continue to be able to uh, sell our hogs and retain our livelihood. So the PQA, TQA, I'm just going to, you know, mention it. I'm sure everybody who works with hogs is PQA certified. TQA certified, meaning you're allowed to uh, truck the pigs. So it's a voluntary program for pork producers. Uh, we're trying to get all of our workers uh, and we wanna demonstrate to our consumers that we're committed as pork producers to uh, validate our training programs. And so it's, it's all about marketing and identifying. Everybody needs to be certified every three years um, and, and truckers. So again, I think most folks understand that. So kind of the next uh, level of increased emphasis is a site assessment. So a PQA, you sit in a, uh, the PQA training, you're either doing it online or sitting in a classroom. The site assessment, an auditor or veterinarian comes to your farm, walks through the facility, and is working with you to make sure that the site assessment implementation items are put in place. So again, uh, in order for you to have a site assessment, you have to be PQA certified. And again, this is done, the site assessment's done every three years. The auditor comes and this took on no, uh, no immediate priority until the packers required it. So once the packers said, hey, you gotta do it if you wanna sell to us, you know, then, then we as an industry sort of got on board. So, uh, this is the site assessment. Uh, TQA, again, I think uh, goes without saying what that is. Anybody who's hauling hogs. 
So the next two programs you may or may not have heard uh, as much about. So the Secure Pork Supply is a, a, a voluntary program and it is developed to aid producers to deal with a foreign animal disease incursion or outbreak of African swine fever, classical swine fever, foot and mouth disease. And all of these are huge concerns to us as an industry of what it would do to packers, uh, what it would do to our export markets, and what it would do to our livelihoods. So again, a voluntary program. It's funded by the Pork Checkoff uh, in conjunction with USDA and APHIS. And we know that if there's at any time going to be an outbreak of a foreign animal disease, there's gonna be restrictions put on our, uh, the movement of hogs. And again, back to all of these are gonna shut things down. So if you've got a nursery, going from nursery to a finisher, if you've got a sow unit, those sow units going to your nursery or finisher, all of those will be impacted. And so the whole purpose for the restrictions that are gonna be put in place by the state regulatory officials is to slow the spread of the disease. But that's what's gonna hurt us as producers. So those restrictions are gonna be put on animals, uh, on animal products, on vehicles, on equipment, and the, pur the purpose of the secure pork supply is to prepare for that and to have things written down so that it's been approved by the state so you're more likely to get uh, exceptions and uh, licenses to be able to move e your pigs around. Uh, so again, voluntary program, it allows for movement to processing or other pork production, production premises, and so it's easier to get those movement permits because in the event of, a, of an outbreak, we anticipate no movement. You have to have a, 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 a permit to be able to move pigs from the nursery to the finisher, and you're going to be able to get those if you have a secure pork supply in hand that you've been, uh, had it approved by the state with wherever you live. So Iowa is gonna be different than Minnesota from, you know, if, I don't know if there's Canadians here, but every, you have to go to your individual location to figure out uh, what that requirement is. So how would you prepare for the secure pork supply? Uh, you first have to have a premise ID. Again, I think uh, most of the folks we work with have premise IDs. Um, the hardest one is gonna be keeping movement records of animals, people, and equipment. And as we go to the next one, uh, there in the Swine Health Improvement Program, they're gonna talk about that being required electronically, which you know I don't think we have any of our folks doing that. So for the secure pork supply, you need a premise ID, you keep track of the movements, you come up with a biosecurity plan for that site you have to train your workers, the caretakers. You have to train them to monitor these uh, signs of foreign animal disease and then be able to take rope fluids, nasal swabs, or blood. So we go out, teach, train uh, the workers or someone on that site to be able to collect that information. Uh, acquiring a premise ID, you need a valid ID. Um, you would contact your state regulatory official uh, if the address isn't correct, we want to make sure that it's there. There can only be one premise ID for each one location. So you can't, it, it's got to be, it's a 911 address. And the purpose of that is if there's a problem, uh, they want to be able to identify where that came from. So when we send in diagnostics, if we've got a, a producer who has 10 finishing sites and we just say, you know, so-and-so grow finish, uh, they really want to be able to track to that individual site so that we can keep track of that. Um, keeping movement records. Uh, again, I think some folks do a better job of this than others, but I think this is probably going to be the hardest if you want to uh, be able to have the movement permits and if you want to try to sign up for the Swine Health Improvement Program. And... Uh, 
So we want to keep track of animal movements, feed deliveries, supplies, equipment, personnel, visitors, and uh, that, you know, it's trace back uh, tracing. So we're trying to keep track of any of those things. So within the secure pork supply, we're identifying a biosecurity manager, and this is all written in this plan. You write the plan down, you submit it to the state, and it gets approved. So we put a biosecurity manager, we write the plan, uh, we define a perimeter buffer, we define a line of separation, and then uh, some self-checklists that get put into place. So this is an example of a sow unit that, uh, that Dr. Lighting and I uh, manage. And so here's the, the county road, here's the entry point. Uh, the perimeter buffer is the blue line going around. And this is part of the document that is submitted to the state for review. Uh, this is a compost shed. So the purpose of this perimeter buffer is we want all of the work that needs to be done on the, as you show up to be done within that perimeter buffer. And so the farmers come in, they park here. We've identified this would be the cleaning and disinfectant area in the, uh, in the event of an outbreak. That's where we would do those things. We don't currently have that in place today but it's identified that that's what we would do. Uh, the dead stock is identified by this black line coming out saying, you know, pigs are gonna be put and put into the compost facility. And so the red line then is the line of separation. And that is the walls that separate inside pigs from outside. So if we were in an area where there were wild pigs or, or wildlife, we wanna make sure that's that line of separation. Um, so we want to clearly identify those areas. Uh, we've got the perimeter buffer. We've got the line of separation uh, with the red. And uh, we want all of those labeled, identified. Uh, so that's the secure pork supply. So again, back to my analogy. Um, the PQA is the individual branches. The secure pork supply is saying, for my operation, here's what we're doing. And uh, we're trying to prevent it. And this next one I'm talking about is fairly new. Uh, it's the Swine Health Improvement Plan. That is the whole forest. And you can think of this as a wildfire. You know, we're wanting, the purpose of this is if we as an industry have the Swine Health Improvement Plan put in place, we potentially continue to, we can possibly continue to export pigs if we've got an outbreak in South Dakota, uh, potentially the rest of the industry can continue to ship pigs overseas, continue to export markets. So that's the concept of why we want to, you know, why the folks advocating this program want it to be put in place. Um, so it's developed aid, uh, oops, I shut it off, I pushed the wrong button, there we go. Um, so we're trying to make sure we eliminate a foreign animal disease, which we talked about, same thing, secure pork supply. And then in the future, it may be allowed to allow us to do things with endemic diseases, meaning PERS, PED, mycoplasma high in ammonia. If we've identified areas um, and we get enough people involved that are willing to share information, we can uh, potentially decrease the incidence of those diseases as well. So again, how is it different from the secure pork supply? It's focused on areas outside of your particular area. So we live in Southwest Minnesota. If we have an outbreak in Southwest Minnesota, producers in Iowa and Missouri and Montana, wherever you're at, can they continue to ship exports or is it, you know, the whole industry shut down? And that's why we're trying to, uh, to think about that. So it's an expansion of the secure pork supply. You really don't do anything more than the secure pork supply except held to a higher standard. And uh, again, the whole point is to assist to keep producers uh, moving their pigs, selling to our packer. 
So a collaboration between USDA, our state boards of animal health, and, um, and USDA, along with industry collaborators. So again, a voluntary program. Uh, this is mimicked after the poultry program. And so there's a uh, national poultry plan and they have over 98% of the industry tied into that. So with all the uh, avian influenza and the, the, the challenges that they're dealing with that, they can continue to export meat because they've got the national poultry plan in place. And, and that I think is, is a really big deal and why you would, we as an industry want to consider this. Um, so it improves preparedness, establishes a playbook of what happens. Uh, it's focused on areas, uh, and it is a pilot program at this time. So if you haven't heard about it, you know, there's, uh, it, it's a pilot program. So again, I jumped ahead a little bit here. Uh, the poultry industry's been doing this for about 100 years. Obviously, that's a more integrated industry than our swine. Um, but it's a collaborate, that poultry plans a collaboration between industry, state, and feds. Uh, they've got about 98, 90% of the industry that's uh, participating. Currently with our swine program, where they're at today, they've got 31 state boards of animal health that are participating, and about 40% of the swine production producers that have committed to this. And obviously as, uh, you know, our swine industry continues to consolidate some, so a lot of that 40% are the larger swine integrators that have said, yeah, we'll, we'll participate. And, uh, you know, the folks that are out pitching this have already went to them and chatted. I think the next things that you'll be hearing are talks like this, where we're getting out in front of producers, more independent producers. So, you know, I would think there'll be some, I think, if you go to World Pork next year, you'll be hearing chatter about this um, and, and other local organizations. Again, we've kind of beat this. Uh, the purpose of this is to kind of have, as an industry, be able to export uh, pigs in the event that we have an outbreak. So how would you sign up? You would uh, first have to complete a secure pork supply You'd sign up for, as a swine health with your official state agency that you're interested in uh, participating in this. Then you'd enroll your swine production facility into that. Uh, you would acknowledge uh, any and understand the requirements for cer certification. You'd complete the biosecurity survey. Uh, again, you're gonna contact uh, the state. Um, this is the big one right here. So you need to demonstrate competency in providing at least 30 days of movement information electronically in a common format to the US uh, officer or of the state agency. So this to me is, is the challenge. I don't, you know, I don't think that there's any easy solution uh, that's currently out there or any program that I've seen that allows for easy gathering of that info. So that, that's kind of the big one and they want it, it can't be on paper, it's gotta be an electronic so that again, in the event of an, of an outbreak, you would say, I'm signed up with the Swine Health Improvement, here's my movement for the last 30 days and they'd be able to, uh, to get that going. So that we'll need to continue to work on. Uh, once you can demonstrate that, you'd get a certificate saying that uh, you know, your swine health improvement plan compliant, you'd get a certificate saying you meet the requirements and uh, again, that's kind of more. So I'll stop there and answer any questions anybody might have on either of the voluntary programs or uh, any swine biosecurity questions that you have. Yeah, I got two uh, couple questions. 
when you demonstrated your finishing barn, different loadout protocols, short of getting a clean truck in, you're at risk pretty much all the time. Is that correct or not correct? Well, uh, so each one of those failures that I talked about are, are important. So to your point, if you don't get in a clean truck, you've got a potential problem, 100% true. But even if you, the whole point of that stage loading exercise was you brought in a dirty trailer and by doing this stage loading procedure, you could keep it out of the barn. And, and that's what they demonstrated with that trial. So we for sure want to try and uh, tell our truckers we want to come with a clean truck. But if that fails, and if they didn't clean and disinfect it, this stage loading uh, research helps to keep it out of the barn was the point of that. But you're, you're, ro you're rolling the dice. Go up 100%, yeah. And we, you do it enough times, you're going to break. Yeah, for sure. Okay. And, you know, the, the argument that somebody could say is if you found one square of uh, fluorescence in the barn and that was PED, it's going to blow. So uh, to your point, we want to make sure we bring in clean trucks, but the stage loading is a secondary uh, biosecurity plan for that. Then on your sow farms, we've had massive purge breaks the last two or three years in the, in the industry. And now I'm seeing sow farms that have depopulated and they're isolated and they're rebreaking again, you know, six, 12 months after they get back up and going. What's going on or how, how are they transporting all this PERS is getting moved from sow farm to sow farm when these sow, a lot of these sow farms are in the middle of, you know, they're pretty secure. Yeah. Or they're, or they're even filtrated and these farms are breaking and then they're re-breaking. I mean, how, what's going on here? What's changed? Yeah, I think that's, I do think that's a great question. Thanks for asking it. And uh, I wish I had the magic wand as did all veterinarians. I've been a practitioner for 35 years now and uh, mystery swine disease, which broke in the early 90s, uh, which then we identified as PERS, you know, has just been such a frustration for us as, as veterinarians and, and for the industry. So to your point, what has changed? I do think that uh, some of the strains that we're dealing with are more virulent and, and more uh, infectious than the, the early strains. So I, I think that could be a consideration. I think as an industry, uh, PED really helped us to focus a little bit on uh, the feed industry, you know, and, and potential viruses that could be coming in with our feedstuffs. Uh, our local mill, New Vision, I, I did call them and ask what percentage of sow diets are using some sort of mitigant, you know, formaldehyde or something that would kill it. And uh, they indicated about 80% of their swine diets that are going out have that in it. Um, now that's in Southwest Minnesota that they're probably uh, reaching. So I don't know if that adoption is as high in other areas and I don't, I don't know where you're at. Um, so I think that's a consideration. I think people movement is still the biggest challenge in my opinion. I think as labor gets tighter, um, potentially that continues to be a challenge. Um, I don't know, Reed, what other things would uh, have changed? Because I appreciate the question of why has it changed? And uh, it, it's always been bad, but it, in the last two years, it's been worse, for I mean, sure. You, you just listed all the different things that, as producers we've done. We feed mitigant, we, we put in more benches, we... I mean, I think biosecurity on these sow farms are higher than it's ever been. Yeah. But the brakes are higher than it's ever been. And so I don't see, don't see, it seems like we're losing here. And I, we had a purge break. We can't figure out how in the world it, it, it got in there. Have no idea. We've, and it's, there's not another farm, you know, there's not any hogs. Or, I mean, it's, and it seems like I bought wean pigs six weeks ago. Two weeks ago, I got a test, a call from the vet, said, hey, by the way, we just broke with PERS. And they depopulated six months ago. Yeah. And luckily, our pigs got out in time, we think. But these re-breaks, is it living in the pits longer? Is it, 
are these is the rodents? I mean, yeah. it seems like we're not gaining with all the technology we have with feed mitigants and everything. We're just not gaining. Yeah. No, I I don't have a good answer for that. I I agree with you that that uh, those are all things we're asking the questions uh, from pits to rodents. Yeah, and. I agree with your your other assessment that we're doing a better job today as an industry than we than we ever did before, and um, you know lo location yeah, I mean clearly we uh, are, I think our back in the day again there's been this whole evolution you know semen was a challenge for a while I think our boar studs you know everybody's checking that before uh, you know checking semen before it gets brought into the operation. So I don't have an explanation for uh, why it's worse today. I think as veterinarians, we're very frustrated and, and the industry continues to ask those questions, but I don't have an answer. Any other questions from anyone? question is, I know you can't answer this question, but what's your level of confidence that we'll continue to keep ASF out of the United States? I know there's no answer, but yeah. you feel pretty confident where we're at? Yeah. You know, I, I think it, I, I guess there's a couple things that I feel that give me confidence, and then there's a couple things that uh, give me great concern. So things that that give me a little bit of confidence is we've had classical swine fever uh, in Haiti and some of those countries for a lot of years, um, you know, and we've never brought those classical swine fever up. And so as you think of movement uh, and those kind of things, that, that gives me a little bit of hope and confidence. Um, things that cause me great concern is, you know, all of the meat products and potential things that uh, they find at the airports and that are continuing to get confiscated. And so, you know, I think we, uh, that, that, that is lots of concern to me. So I think as you take the whole, this, what we're talking about here, there's going to have to be three failures for that to occur. You know, to, to think that ASF isn't going to enter the United States, I think is pretty naive. It's may be entered already. Uh, then the next piece is how would it get transported and then how would it get brought into our facilities to get contaminated. And so I think those are three, you know, different failures that have to occur. So, you know, I worry about our, our wild hog population and once it gets here, you know, that'll be a, a big concern, you know, in, in the southern states. So, you know, I think it's... Uh, the whole industry is worried about it. There's, I, I'm happy that I've worried about foot and mouth disease for 30 years, and uh, you know it hasn't come in. So in, in my practice career, obviously, and classical swine fever hasn't come in, and African swine fever hasn't either. But it's something we worry about every day. Any other questions? Okay, well, I think we're uh, at time, so thanks for your attendance, and on behalf of FBN Southwest, we appreciate your business. Thanks for coming.